I'm ready. <clears throat> and we are live. Hopefully. Yes, let's make sure that it's popping up on my channel. Come on. But in the case that we're just wasting time making sure that it's popping up, this dude here is Caleb Beers. This is actually his stream. Don't let it confuse you that I'm actually the one streaming it. We're having technical difficulties, and this is the only way that you're going to get to parlor. Yes. Now, uh, thank you all for showing up to today's episode of the parlor. Today, we will be covering Thus Spake Zarathustra chapters 25 and 26. And I do want to BS a little before we start because I want to give some time for some people to show up. Hey, Ordo, what's going on, man? Ordo, whose uh, icon is the Wheel of Dharma or the Wheel of the Law, if I'm not mistaken. And you just said hi there using my account, Matt. Interesting. So now I'm the Which only one. Fun. So I'm the only one that can. Hey, wait a minute. I can, if you say something, I can go and use your account to give you admin privileges. If you're logged into a separate account. Oh, this is fun. <laughs> no, I'm logged into the same account. Oh, lovely. So I can attempt to. Log in as me, okay. then, and see what happens. Yeah, you don't have to be logged in to stream. Ah, lovely. Hey, Slemon. Slemon and Ordo are both here. There we go. It was a bit of a matrix glitch to see something I did not type pop up <laughs> with my name. That was highly <laughs> Well, the interesting thing is, I couldn't type. I couldn't type anything. I wasn't able to give you admin rights or do anything of that nature yesterday. It was probably because everything was transferring over. Yesterday, I was actually logged into your account, uh, and I was attempting to give you admin rights, but I kept on getting locked out of it. So I wasn't able to give your other account admin rights on your own channel. So I'm sorry. <laughs> right. So, here we go. I'll put the link. I think I'm logged in as me now. That is the link to what it is we'll be discussing on this stream. Yes, and you should all uh, click the like button if you have not already, and then go ahead and open up the text to make it easier to read. We're dealing with chapter 25 of and Thus Spake Zarathustra. Here. The pitiful. And well, Morpheus. This is chapter thing. 25. The pitiful. My friends, there hath arisen a satire on your friend. Behold, Zarathustra, walketh he not amongst us as if amongst animals? Now, what that means is oh, look at Zarathustra. That prick, he thinks he's better than us. But it is better said in this wise, the discerning one walketh amongst men as amongst animals. So he's not even denying it. Man, yeah, he's not denying it. And it's not even as if, it just is. So his response is basically, middle finger, which is typical of Nietzsche. Man himself is to the discerning one, the animal with red cheeks. Because people are embarrassed or ashamed around the discerning one. Embarrassed or ashamed around the discerning one, hence red cheeks. Blushing, embarrassed, ashamed. How hath that happened unto him? Is it not because he hath had to be ashamed too oft? So him here is referring to man. Because... Mm, the history of mankind, as he says in this next sentence, O oh, my friends, thus speaketh the discerning one. Shame, shame, shame. That is the history of man, because the history of man is shameful, and people have had to be ashamed too often. Can, can you help unpack that a little bit more, Matt? Why is shame uh, so relevant here? 
Well, it has to do with Nietzsche's worldview, and he'll actually be unpackaging it even more in chapter 26. But at least to my understanding, the basic reason that uh, Nietzsche doesn't like shame is because uh, he believes there is no God. Basically, uh, the Enlightenment has gone and shown us that there is no God. God is dead. And, well, I suppose because we need to do something, something meaningful, something productive, and so on, uh, Nietzsche is suggesting that we all go and try to become the Superman. Well, how in the world are you going to be Superman if you're ashamed of every little thing you do? If you're constantly worrying about stepping on people's toes and cowering, having your shoulders low, you know, not making eye contact with anybody, making yourself as unobtrusive and little as possible, not taking up space, uh, saying I'm sorry for every little thing you do, saying excuse me for things that don't even need excuse. All those things are antithetical uh, in Nietzsche's uh, worldview to being great, to becoming the Superman, etc. Right. I'm going to be posting the link to the text periodically. Uh, for no other reason than that I want people to constantly see it whenever they uh, tune in. Lovely. And even without the death of God, it's still a very, uh, it's still kind of a pitiful thing. It's astute even outside of that. Well, huh? p partially, it's pitiful. I mean, the, the, but there is, the thing is, there is a, an appropriate place for shame. If you have done something that is actually shameful, then you should have shame. But don't go and let some weird complex or what have you make you behave shamefully without a really good reason. You know, if 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 I go and I screw something up that costs a hundred people their lives or a thousand people their lives or what have you, that 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 is that would be shameful of me, especially if it was something that I could have by some better effort or some better preparation have avoided. Um, I, 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 I think that there, there is a place for shame. And though Nietzsche is kind of making a blanket statement saying, oh, we should never be shameful. We should just plow forward. I'm, I'm thinking there, there, there is a healthy place for it, but definitely not to the extent that, um, well, the puritanical people would think, or that pietistic people would think, or that a lot of the religious people that were uh, essentially dominating the mainstream at the time of Nietzsche were would think and promote. But that's kind of going a little bit too far into chapter 26, which I don't really mind doing, except for the fact that we're going to be covering that in more detail later this evening. Or morning, or afternoon, depending on where you're at. And on that account doth the noble one enjoin upon himself not to abash. Bashfulness doth he enjoin on himself in presence of all sufferers. So, the discerning one the wise one, I, Friedrich Nietzsche, the smartest person ever, etc. The discerning one enjoins on himself not to abash anybody. You know, people said of Richard Feynman at one point that he could explain anything to even the, answer the most foolish question without making you feel like a fool, and that's one thing that made him a good teacher. Because if the, if the discerning one wants people to actually get what he's saying and wants them to follow him, he makes it a point not to embarrass people. And bashfulness doth he enjoin on himself in presence of all sufferers. He enjoins bashfulness on himself. So why would he do that, Matt? Why would Zarathustra do that? Or why would Nietzsche do that? Or why might we... Do that. The discerning one. 
Okay. Sorry. Why would the why why would the <laughs> discerning one do that? Well, I think it has to do with um good old basic emotional manipulation, which is which is what normal people call uh, empathy. Uh, normal people call this 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 emotionally manipulative icky thing empathy. Uh, in that you go and you somehow ascertain what the, uh, the 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 general atmosphere of a place is or the demeanor of the people around is and you mirror it to some extent so that you can be heard now of course that would be the the manipulative person's understanding of the situation lots of people just say well all we're doing is connecting we're connecting over shared experience but the reason it doesn't necessarily apply to nietzsche is or Zarathustra um, is because he is the discerning one. He sees through that. He goes another layer deeper, where it's not just uh, primary responses to feelings, but planning and calculating and thinking. Perhaps in a uh, what people would uh, call a Machiavellian way, he sees what people need him to be in order to accept his message, and he becomes uh, to them that. It's like uh, the St. Paul says the same thing about that in terms of uh, 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 preaching uh, 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 the gospel of Jesus Christ, where he says to the ones under the law, I've become like those under the law, and to the ones who are not under the law, I basically do my best to behave as if I'm not under the law, even though I do have some laws I still need to obey, uh, and so on. So so it's just a question of um, uh, fitting in. And making people Precisely. or allowing people to feel good around you. And notice he starts off with the middle finger, yes, I'm walking among you as among animals, but at the same time, he's also saying, well, and I can be quiet and bashful if that's what it takes to get you to listen. And they're in on it, too. If he goes and he says, that's exactly what I'm doing, I, w I walk around men as if I'm on uh, animals, he's not saying that you can't do it, too. Nowhere did he ever say you can't do it, too. And if these people right. are his disciples, they're kind of thinking, well, you know, I can go and emulate him, too. I can go and be careful and watch my step. Um, watch my words, uh, chameleon myself. I can go and do all these different things too. I can go and do things to the next level, so to speak. It's like Nietzsche or Zarathustra is not precluding anybody from doing the same. Right. May my destiny... Oh, wait, no. Verily, I like them not, the merciful ones, whose bliss is in their pity. Too destitute are they of bashfulness. Now, this is something interesting, because people who pity other people make it look like what they're doing is a good thing. People who insist on pitying someone else make it look like they're, you know, fucking Mother Teresa over here. Uh, the Holy Mother... And they try to act as if what they're doing is so humane and empathetic. And, oh, I feel everything you feel. Oh, I feel so sorry for you. Yeah, ha, bullshit. See, what's actually going on there is when someone pities someone else, they have to put themselves in into a superior position in order to do so. So what does that mean? That means that pity is a subtle, passive, aggressive means of elevating yourself above someone else. But it's because you're too weak to do it straightforwardly. Too destitute are they of bashfulness. They're actually the ones that lack bashfulness, who uh, who they, they pretend to be bashful, but really they're not. If I must be pitiful, I dislike to be called so. And if I be so, it is preferably at a distance. So if you want to pity me, I, I'd rather you not pity me, and if you do, do it somewhere where I can't hear it. 
Mm-hmm. There's there's some. Um, I'm trying to think if it's called the games people play, and um, it talks about the the basic social dynamics that um, the author has observed, uh, and he observes that. Essentially, there's three roles that each party can take. The role of the adult, the role of the parent, and the role of the child. So if you have a two children, they'll just, you know, do what children do. And if you have two parents, they'll just, you know, one of them will likely go in and default to the role of the child. Perhaps if you have two children, one of them will default to the role of the parent as I definitely have had a chance to see that can definitely take place, especially when you have a two-year-old and a one-year-old, and you have the two-year-old playing police. Um, and what I would imagine that Nietzsche's ideal in terms of interpersonal communication would be that responsible adults would communicate with responsible adults as responsible adults, that you don't need to go and baby somebody and feed them the titty bottle in order to get them to understand something. But you approach them with dignity, approach them with respect, both respect for yourself and for someone else uh, and, and for whoever the other person is that you're talking to. You don't need to pity them even if they are in a worse situation because you can just be there for them in an appropriate manner, a supportive manner as opposed to a passive-aggressive condescending one, and still supporting them in such a way that you're not enabling bad behavior. I mean, this actually takes a great deal of wisdom to be able to pull off. It's not just a gigantic cesspool of fifis where you do what feels right. You actually have to be wise and exercise good judgment in terms of all these different kinds of social interactions that you can have with other people, whether you're being given to, whether you're being uh, the giver, all of it behave like you're a responsible adult. And if you're any older than 11 years old, you don't really have an excuse. Right. And, you know, the, the book Games People Play is actually an excellent book because, it, like Matt said, it points out that there's these three roles people can play, the parent, child, and adult. And there are a lot of people, especially really insecure people, who will always try to push you into the child role using one of these games. And there are many, many ways out of it, but in my experience, the best way is just not to interact with that sort of person. Um. Preferably, also, do I shroud my head and flee, before being recognized, and thus do I bid you do, my friends. Oh, hey, what did I just say? If somebody is like that and insists on pitying you as a passive-aggressive means of getting above you, give them the finger and run. Or don't even give them the finger. Shroud your head and run and don't let them see your face. May my destiny ever lead unafflicted ones like you across my path, and those with whom I may have hope and repast in honey in common. Unafflicted ones. Unafflicted ones. People who are not suffering from these uh, various spiritual or psychological maladies that cause them to act in basically like idiots. Uh, you know, Part of the problem here, Matt, is there any way you can close out your browser and or everything but the video chat on your browser and use your phone to get in the chat? Uh, unfortunately, no, there isn't, and I don't think that the problem is that. I think the okay. I think the 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 problem is actually with OBS. Um. Okay, well, do, we'll just uh, may, keep doing do you, what we do for now, does, and we'll do does it, troubleshooting in between. Sounds good. We'll, we'll, we'll continue with this. And Okay. All right, one moment, and I'm going to communicate by text a lot with everyone. Let's see if that helps. Is that any better? Yes. Or it should be. I see our videos are moving now. Good. In the... 
I'm just not going to see the chat at all. Just don't worry about that. I'm not going to see the chat. So. All right, Uh, guys, if you have any questions for Matt, just tell me and I'll relay it to him. Because I'm actually using my phone's internet. So I can't use my phone for that. Verily, I have done this and that for the afflicted, but something better did I always seem to do when I had learned to enjoy myself better. And that's uh, there's a lot there. You can do things and sort of grin and bear it, and that is admirable in some ways, but it's not the best thing. The best thing is when you're absorbed in what you're doing to the point where you're sort of in this flow state and you're enjoying what you're doing. And that's when you're going to do your best work. The whole grin and bear it thing is admirable because it's difficult, but the fact that it's difficult doesn't mean you get better results. Since humanity came into being, man hath enjoyed himself too little. That alone, my brethren, is our original sin. But that doesn't mean having fun like a stupid person. Right. But you were saying? To be honest, I mean, it is true that you can do the wrong thing with enjoyment. It is true you can do the wrong thing by, you know, giving in to some sort of desire that you should not have. But it is also true that uh, you can do the wrong thing and be hurt by it while you're doing it. You know, uh, Marcus Aurelius has this little this little observation he makes that someone who co- commits an offense out of anger is somehow less blamable than someone who commits an offense with pleasure. Because the one who commits an offense with pleasure seems like a weakling, or not even a weakling, like a malicious weakling who's enjoying what he's doing and, you know, being sort of this slimy little uh, good for nothing. Whereas somebody who commits a wrong out of anger, is it's almost as if they were compelled by pain to do it, which they still shouldn't, but it's less blamable that way. And Nietzsche is addressing the second case and saying that happens way too much. And, you know, he has a point because it's the best people, the, the otherwise good people, who are compelled to do wrong in that way. And when we learn better to enjoy ourselves, then do we unlearn best to give pain unto others and to contrive pain. And this, there's a lot in this, too. When we learn better to enjoy ourselves, when we learn better to enjoy ourselves, when we get better at enjoying ourselves, when we get better at having fun and doing what is good for us or what we enjoy, then do we unlearn best to give pain unto others. Because the less pain you're in, the less you're going to want to inflict it on someone else. And to contrive pain, he says. If you think about all the malicious people, and you think about all of the people who really you know, hatch these little schemes to screw with other people, it's usually the people who aren't happy themselves. The people, you know, someone who is deeply depressed also tends to be kind of a stick in the mud and kind of an asshole. Therefore do I wash the hand that hath helped the sufferer. Therefore do I wipe also my soul. Or in Nietzsche's case, put on some gloves before you even touch them. Wash the hand that hath helped the sufferer. Because you don't want to carry away some of their contagion, you know. He says in Beyond Good and Evil, one should be careful when one fights with monsters, lest one become a monster. Well, in this case, you should be careful when you handle the sick, lest you become sick. Therefore, do I also do I wipe my soul? Because he's talking about mental or spiritual or behavioral things here. He's talking about more abstract things. For in seeing the sufferer suffering, thereof was I ashamed on account of his shame. And in helping him, sorely did I wound my pride. Matt, why would that happen? For in seeing the sufferer suffering, thereof was I ashamed on account of his shame. And in helping him, sorely did I wound his pride. Well, this kind of goes back to what you were talking about before, about, uh, you know, helping the sick people and becoming sick yourself um not that it's the same dynamic but that but that a lot of the same forces are in play 
So imagine that regardless of whether you have depression or not, imagine somehow uh, taking care of somebody who is depressed. Now, if you know, all right, so, so let's take the case that you have depression. It's going to be insanely difficult for you to do anything about the situation. All you're going to do is basically hold the other person in contempt because there you are. You don't have your stuff figured out. And you're there trying to convince this other person that you have your stuff figured out and they should listen to you. So that's just that that that's just contempt, and that will generally blow up in your face. The uh, other side of the issue is, and uh, this is actually one of the best ways of telling whether or not someone else has depression. If you don't have depression yourself, and you are around somebody who is depressed, and being around that person makes you feel angry it's very likely that the other person is depressed and you are not. If, if you have even a suspicion that somebody is depressed and their lethargy or what have you aggravates you, it could very well be because you aren't depressed, you don't have that same kind of, of, of actual empathy as opposed to cognitive empathy, especially if you're a highly conscientious person, it can drive you crazy, but re but but returning to the to, right. to to the case number one, returning to the case number one, uh, you know when the blind leadeth the blind, the both falleth into the ditch. And even if you aren't suffering to begin with, uh, a if you aren't suffering, you're coming down in a condescending way often to help. And b if you are suffering, you're useless. And I don't mean if you're suffering in terms of like we all suffer. Life is light, light, life. There's a lot of suffering in life. But I mean if if you're suffering from the thing you're trying to help somebody else to get rid of, then you're just being a, t a contemptuous a hole. But what were you saying, Mister Beers? And you know it's what you were saying about a depressed person being annoying to be around. Yeah, when somebody's a stick in the mud and you're basically living with Eeyore. Yeah, that, that's irritating, and it can very quickly cause you to be in a less healthy state because you're dealing with someone who is, you know, can't go 10 seconds without emotionally pooping themselves. <laughs> yeah. For in seeing the sufferer suffering, thereof was I ashamed on account of his shame. And in helping him, sorely did I wound his pride. So you feel shame because he's ashamed. Yeah, you, you, you wind up getting that empathy him, thing going. Yeah, it, it's, it's that dynamic of and coming. Like... Yeah. But what were you saying? I think that we're getting a little bit of, of audio delay here. For in seeing the sufferer suffering. Thereof was I ashamed on account of his shame, and in helping him, sorely did I wound his pride. Because if you help someone when they're suffering, that is condescending, and they're going it's going to wound their pride. And helping them without doing that is very difficult. That's one reason why he says, thereof was I ashamed on account of his shame. Go ahead and feel the shame they're feeling, so maybe they won't reject your help. But then that... Great. But then that Go can ahead. be painful. Right. Like, like, th like that. And you have to be careful when you handle yourself not to get sick. Exactly. A a exactly. And that's why this whole, um, uh, if, if you aren't familiar, there's this, a parable about loving one's neighbor. So Jesus basically said, uh, to people that were listening to him to love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then some pedantic wise-ass decides to ask, 
well, who is my neighbor? Basically, he's trying to come up with an excuse to not have to help people. At least that's the way I understand it. And then Jesus tells the story that there was a Samaritan. So basically a um, a, a, a half-blood or uh, somebody that was part Israelite and then uh, um, part Assyrian. So, so Israelites didn't like them very much. They lived in the north. Uh, and this... Um, the, the, the Samaritan happened to be the only one that helped an Israelite. There was a priest that came and a Pharisee or whoever it was that came. Uh, and, 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 and the, the, the pariah was ultimately the only one that would render aid to an injured man, as opposed to the people that for all intents and purposes should have. And, uh, in this this um, this dynamic of, of 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 sympathy and empathy is viewed that okay you should you should be able to do good to people and then some people do realize well if I do good then I can get sucked into the maelstrom it takes a very 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 strong person uh, the Samaritan being 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 the 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 example to be able to render aid without succumbing. And, interestingly, this dynamic is the same exact dynamic that Nietzsche brings into play when he discusses love. It is giving from a position of abundance. Because you can't give what you don't have to give. Great obligations do not make grateful, but revengeful. And when a small kindness is not forgotten, it becometh a gnawing worm. When a sm small kindness is not forgotten, it becometh a gnawing worm. Because people will feel resentful if you give them something really good because they feel like a pauper and feel like you're a king. They feel like you have more than they do. That's why people, it becomes a gnawing worm inside of them that they are feel obligated to you, like they owe you something that they can't repay. So, and can, because of that, go ahead. I was go just, ahead. I was just going to ask you a question. If you've met, have have you met people that do th th that thing where they'll go and do you favors? And then implicitly expect you to reciprocate in a way that isn't clear. So they'll basically be disingenuous little poops in order to um, not have to directly ask for what it is that they want. And then they play this game where, where we all just kind of, in a very often misdirected and nebulous fashion give things so that we can somehow have a right to claim things later. Like in advertising, when when you'll have uh, the people giving you the free little wedges of cheese in the store or whatever on a stick so that you'll eat one of those and then feel obligated to buy the whole thing. Or I mean, have you have you seen people doing that kind right. of a thing in real life? Like, And, and if you have, what, what sorts of things yeah. do you see coming from it? There is a... There... There is a name for it in anthropology. In anthropology, that's called potlatching. Mm. To potlatch someone is to give someone something so they'll give something back. Now, there, there's two sides to this. One, reciprocity is totally legitimate. If someone does a lot of good for me, I will try to get them back. Not because I owe it to them, but because they deserve it, and those are two different things. Giving someone what you owe them is not exactly the same as giving them what they deserve. That being said, there are people who will give things to try to get things back from you. And that's a game people play while acting as if they're just doing it out of the goodness of their heart. The thing is, uh, like Nietzsche says, like Matt says, like I say, to really give comes from a position of abundance. If you give from a position of abundance, you don't expect anything back because you already have enough. 
to give and expect something back, to give something in order to get something back is to give from a position of poverty, to give what you can't afford. And that's what makes it disingenuous. Because it will lead to resentment on the part of one or the other, the giver or the receiver. It can lead to resentment on the part of the giver if this implicit reciprocity isn't actually taking place, and it can uh, lead to resentment uh, on the part of the receiver for the reasons that Caleb has already mentioned. Right. So the question then becomes, what can a person do if they have nothing to give? Obviously, you don't just want to leave them out of this. If they have nothing to give, that's the situation they're in, regardless of if it's their fault or not. If someone has nothing to give, there has to be a way out for them. So what Nietzsche says is, be by in accepting, distinguish by accepting. Thus do I advise those who have not to bestow. Distinguish by accepting. Don't just take any help you can get. Pick carefully. And what that's doing is that's basically withholding your acceptance unless it's someone who has something that you really need and who you think deserves to be the giver. And in that way, you have given something back in a legitimate way, and it is something that you have to give. It's your own sort of abundance that you can create for yourself, and that's the way out. So what Nietzsche is doing here is critical, is he's not saying, oh, well, you're impoverished, screw you, go die in a gutter. And I don't mean impoverished monetarily, I mean mentally, physically, emotionally, whatever, any sense of impoverishment you like. What Nietzsche is saying is, is be shy and accepting from other people. If you're depressed, say, don't accept anybody's consolation. Distinguish who you would accept it from by allowing them to be that person. And what that does then is it creates an acceptance. It, it creates an abundance in the person who has nothing, and that allows them to actually participate in this. Beggars, however, one should entirely do away with. Verily, it annoyeth one to give unto them, and it annoyeth one not to give unto them. So they create problems no matter where they are. Don't be a beggar. Don't beg. And if someone offers you something, turn it away, unless they're the right one. Then when someone offers you something, you go, you, they actually feel good about giving it to you. And likewise, sinners and bad consciences, believe me, my friends, the sting of conscience teacheth one to sting. Now, he does have a point here. This is coming for Nietzsche from an anti-Christian position, but it doesn't have to. But the culture that he's in does have this nasty, and the culture we're in, too, has this nasty feature where people who have what used to be called scruples have a bad conscience. Scruples, the Latin word, means a small, sharp stone, like something you're sitting on or that's in your clothes that's bothering you, it's poking you. That's like the conscience. And the sting of a person's conscience teaches them to sting other people because what their conscience says to them in their head that they've done wrong comes out of their mouths and stings someone else, so to speak. Someone who is constantly feeling guilty about being lazy will accuse everyone else of being lazy. Their conscience is stinging them for being lazy, and they accuse others of being lazy. And that's just because laziness happens to be on the mind. Uh, Caleb, how is the how is right. the transmission? Is it are are you able to hear anything? Let me make sure. Yeah, it sounds smooth to me. Okay, good. Through the you through YouTube, my YouTube app. The worst things, however, are the petty thoughts. Oh, it's lagging a bit. There we go. The worst things, however, are the petty thoughts. Verily, better to have done evilly 
than to have thought pettily. To be sure, ye say, the delight in petty evil spareth one many a great evil deed, but here one should not wish to be sparing. Like a boil is the evil deed. It itcheth and irritateth and breaketh forth. It speaketh honorably. Behold, I am diseased, saith the evil deed. That is its honorableness. But like infection is the petty thought. It creepeth and hideth and wanteth to be nowhere until the whole body is decayed and withered by the petty infection. And the reason I read all those together without unpacking them is because it needs uh, it needs to be analyzed from the whole. He's talking about well, – oh, here, let me relate it to something else. Which is worse, to be creepy or to be terrifying? Creepy is the guy who sits in the corner of the bar and keeps staring at you and looks away whenever you look at him. Terrifying is the guy who smacks your drink off the counter and says, I'm sitting here. It's better to be terrifying. There's at least some honesty in that. At least that can be dealt with without so much effort. At least that it advertises itself. At least you can see it. At least it advertises itself. It's a boil. You can see the boil. The creepiness is an infection. It's better to be terrifying than to be creepy. It's better to do a great evil deed than to have petty thoughts. The great evil deed at least has honesty, which is a virtue. The petty thoughts are just a disease that rots you. To him, however, who is possessed of a devil, I would whisper this word in the ear. Better for thee to rear up thy devil. Even for thee there is still a path to greatness. And there are two sides to this. There are two sides to this. Rear up your devil. By your devil, Nietzsche means the evil part of you, or the part of you that you perceive as evil. To him, however, who is possessed of a devil, I would whisper this word in the ear. Better for thee to rear up thy devil. Even for thee, there is still a path to greatness. So let's say you're a person for whom chastity is a virtue. You don't believe in promiscuity. And let's say you're also a huge horn dog. Well, that's a problem. Well, rear up your devil. Take that, uh, that sexual desire and rear it up to maturity and get married. Bring it, there is a point in life, as Nietzsche says, where your worst qualities are rebaptized as your best, where they reach a maturity where they can become a positive thing. Rear up your devil. It's only a devil because it's a baby. By the time it grows up, it'll be an angel. Rear up your devil. If you are kind of an annoyed person all the time and you're pissed off all the time and that's your devil, well, that's because it's still a baby. Rear it up and make it into a rage, not just a rage, but an ambition that will drive you to get things done. Rear up your devil. To him, however, who is possessed of a devil, I would whisper this word in the ear. Better for thee to rear up thy devil. Even for thee, there is still a path to greatness. Your worst qualities will be rebaptized as your best. Your worst qualities will be rebaptized as your best. Take those bad qualities and mature them into something good. And even the most evil people in history at least had some virtue. I mean, look at Joseph Stalin. Was he an asshole? Yeah. Stalin was an asshole. Stalin was a sociopath. Stalin was crazy and murderous and bloodthirsty and vengeful and terrifying. Stalin was a horrible human being. Everyone around him was afraid of him. But you know what? He also brought a peasant surf, backward, backwater peasant surf kingdom, Russia, into a superpower. As bad as he was, you can't deny he got some shit done. Because even the greatest evil people would not be so great if they had some kind of virtue. And even some small good can still come from it. What really causes human beings to degenerate is not bad intentions or ambition. What causes us to de degenerate is to sit around sucking our thumbs and not doing anything. That's typically when bad people pop up. Rear up thy devil. Better for thee to rear up thy devil, 
Even for thee, there is still a path to greatness. Matt, do you have anything to say about that? Well, it seems like you already unpackaged that quite a bit yesterday, too. I'm trying to remember whether that was on stream or after stream uh, when we had that comp that little uh, discussion on maturity. Right. In that, um, yeah, if, and I'll be the first to admit that uh, for me, if you want to talk about uh, uh, virtues and vices, the whole uh, chastity habit being a virtue and being a horn dog, it basically described me, and that was one of the uh, that was one of the predominant reasons I got married so early. I was, you know, you 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 you, you make it. well, you chant. Well, it's like if 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 you have this this. Uh, constraint no sex outside of marriage i want to have sex well then i guess i better be searching to get married and if i go and i believe that marriage needs to be something good well then i guess i better be searching for a good woman to begin with so right so 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 maybe you don't maybe you don't need to always avoid like, like avoid doing the wrong things, certainly. But if at all possible, find a way of channeling what it is that's driving you in that direction and using it as fuel and as machinery to push you in a direction that you should be going. That's actually, and I would say that women don't necessarily have this problem categorically as much as men do. I mean, that's what this whole adolescence, teenage thing is about. I think that adolescence is kind of like forced immaturity. But there is this period of, of puberty and it's, you know, the few years after that where where boys and men generally try to figure out what's going on and 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 establish their position in the pecking order and establish themselves as being capable of doing X, Y, and Z. And a lot of that is lost if the entire if you're told to do nothing but tow the line and you tow the line without actually yourself coming to the conclusion that it's something you need to do if you don't recognize it as being something good then eventually you're going to rebel and the longer you put it off the worse the rebellion is going to be so what a good father will do at that particular point is help his son to channel these rebellious energies into something productive. He'll be able to provide gentle, kind leadership while simultaneously treating him as an equal, as a fellow adult. So, I feel very, very sorry for you if you didn't have a dad to show you that. I feel incredibly sorry for you. But the fact of the matter is, if you didn't, that still doesn't preclude you from having to go through that same kind of, through that same kind of, um, growth. It's going to be more tough for you. But I guarantee you, you'll be able to, if you search hard enough, if that's what you want, if you search long and hard enough and prioritize being able to channel your passions appropriately, you'll find somebody that will be able to help you. Both who can and who will. person will be very rare and that person will be very special to you, but you'll find them. Ah, my brethren, one knoweth a little too much every one, and many a one become transparent to us, but still we can by no means penetrate him. If you know a lot about someone and you understand them fully and they're transparent, sometimes even then you can't help them. You don't know what to do for them. You cannot penetrate. You can't get through to them. And nothing you say will get across the gap and make them change their ways. 
they've become totally transparent. It is difficult to live among men because silence is so difficult. And this dovetails, this actually adds to that first thing I just read. Uh, in answer to David Sanderson, it, the, the stream will last a few more minutes till we finish this chapter, then a 20 minute break, and then we'll be back for the next one. Why is this stream like toilet paper? Oh, <laughs> we use enough to do the job. But it's difficult to live among men because silence is so difficult because if someone is silent – or not silent, sorry. If someone is transparent to you and you can't help them despite understanding them, that means you just have to keep your peace and say nothing, which is hard. Or to just flat out admit I can't help you. But even then, they're going to be like, well, why do I need your help? Well, I can see why, can you? And, and not to him who is offensive to us are we most unfair, but to him who doth not concern us at all. And that's another thing. If you detach from them, they're going to shit on you. Your People are most unfair to someone who has completely detached from them. If you say, I'm sorry, I can't help you, and then walk away... They are going to be more unfair to you than to anyone else. Well, yeah, because if... It is, what is the opposite of love? Hate. No, it's not. Apathy is. Apathy. Apathy is the opposite of both love and hate. If you hate someone, you are obsessed with them. If you love someone... And I'm talking the... the, the um. The, 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 the impassioned version. If you love someone, you are obsessed with them. Even if you're charitable or giving or loving in a Nietzschean way, you're still in a, in a way obsessed with the target, especially as we were discussing yesterday in um, uh, chapters uh, 23 and 4. Um, but if you're apathetic, the person just isn't on your radar. I mean, if you really want to annoy somebody, take the... just. Take the bratty little kids that act like little turds and don't pay them any mind because the reason that they're acting like brats is because they want your attention. And no, I'm actually not talking about my own children. I'm talking about those annoying little 11 or 12-year-olds at the mall that you see going and causing havoc and ruining everything or the uh, just the, the people that do these idiotic behaviors that couldn't be construed as anything other than attention seeking it's like you can hate them they'll get what they want you can love them they'll get what they want you can be completely apathetic and don't give them any mind and that'll drive them crazy because they want your attention yeah apathy is death exactly Exactly. If, however, thou hast a suffering friend, then be a resting place for his suffering. Like a hard bed, however, a camp bed. Thus wilt thou serveth him, serve him best. So, you know, don't be gushy about it. Don't uh, tell them it's all right when it's not. But on the other hand, yes, they can rest with you. Yes, you are safe for them. Maybe not pleasant, but safe. Don't coddle someone, but do provide safe harbor. You know, you, you have to resist the urge to coddle, but you also can't say, get the hell out. And that's actually a point that my wife and I made when we first moved in together. When we first moved in together, we decided that our place would be a sanctuary of sorts. There would be no taboo topics. People could come here for whatever reason, and as long as they obeyed the house rules, they were welcome. But the caveat is they need to respect the house rules, and they need to put up with us. And it's amazing, if you're just open about that, what kinds of people will show up. And it's amazing what kinds of people will refuse to be there. 
You can you, you you can learn a lot by having that attitude, and then you realize who your real friends are. Your friends are the ones who will be a hard bed for you, and for whom you can be their hard bed. You can spar with friends too. You know, as iron sharpens iron. You know, there there there's there's a lot to friendship, and yeah, it involves. A lot of it involves uh, lovingly being what the other person needs you to be, which incidentally means constantly transforming yourself into a better version of yourself so that you can be to anybody. I mean, of course, you can think of people generically, but there, there, there are certain things that are just virtuous in and of themselves. So, folk, so even in terms of being a friend, focusing on your own virtue is the best position that you can come from in order to do that to somebody else or in order to be that for someone else. And if a friend doeth thee wrong, then say, I forgive thee what thou hast done unto me, that thou hast done it unto thyself, however. How could I forgive that? That's that's a particularly poignant. How could I forgive that? Not oh, how dare you do that to yourself? You're not judging them for it. What you're saying is, is I am incapable. It is impossible, logically impossible, for me to forgive you for something you did to yourself. The only person who can forgive you for that is you. Yeah, you can forgive them, but you can't make them forgive themselves. That's the point. You don't control other people. Thus speaketh all great love. It surpasseth even forgiveness and pity, which is true. Love is above forgiveness and it's above pity. Maybe it does forgive and maybe it even feels pity sometimes, but it's above that. It's beyond that. One should hold fast one's heart, for when one letteth it go, how quickly doth one's head run away. Holy crap, is that where that phrase came from? Mm-hmm. heart ran away with your head ah uh-huh. uh, where in the world have there been greater follies than with the pitiful and what in the world hath caused more suffering than the follies of the pitiful nietzsche has this other aphorism it is through pity that suffering first became contagious and that covers those points about handling the sick that we covered earlier in this stream yeah be well be strong if you're going to do that and even Whoa. then only do so in as much as you can. Woe unto all loving ones who have not an elevation which is above their pity. So that's how you can be strong. You have to have some imperative higher than the pity that can control it. That's the key. Which means that you can't be an emotional basket case. Certainly you can have emotions as part of the human experience. However, the categorical imperative is exceedingly important. The North Star uh, with which you can aim yourself, the principles that you will not let go of, the virtues that you uh, subscribe to and are attempting to attain ever more and ever increasingly over time all these things will keep you grounded and if you don't have a value system that's another thing that i i do feel sorry for you if you don't because a value system helps to orient you in the world of course everyone has one to some extent or you won't be able to survive like at some point, you value peeing more than you value eating because you find yourself peeing. At some point, you value pooping more than you value sleeping unless you're pooping the bed, etc. But we can have more nuanced or even just more encompassing value systems that helps us in our decision making. But unless that is solid... And unless it somehow transcends these base emotions, we'll get wrapped up in these base emotions and find it an awful lot more difficult to function in the world.
Thus spoke the devil unto me once upon a time. Even God hath his hell, it is his love for man. And lately did I hear him say these words, God is dead, out of his pity for man hath God died. Which is funny because you can take that in two completely opposite senses, depending oh, yeah. on your inclinations. Oh yeah. So be ye warned against pity. From thence there yet cometh unto men a heavy cloud. Verily I understand weather signs. Uh, yeah, you know that whole communism thing, that whole socialism thing, all the leftism, uh, Red Scare, the Soviet Union, Marxist Revolution? Yeah, he saw the dark clouds of that on the way, and it's a sign that comes from pity. It's a heavy cloud that comes from pity. But attend also to this word. All great love is above all its pity, for it seeketh to create what is loved. There's the thing. All great love is above all its pity. Uh, well, Ordo asks what's love for Nietzsche, and, I, and basically love for Nietzsche is doing and giving and saying helpful things that create good things in the world purely out of the desire to do so. Just total disinterested, I have so much in me, I'm going to give it out. Yes, out of abundance. So sort of if you've ever been so happy, you wanted to run outside, find the nearest person and hug them, not because you like them particularly much, but just because you're so fucking happy right now. That's what he's talking about, that feeling. And not just that feeling, but that state. Yes, like a fountain that is constantly gushing. Like a spring that is constantly gushing. It's love is for Nietzsche almost a a thing that comes out of not necessarily one's nature, because well, unless we can go and say that one's nature would be mutable in some way, but that out of producing, out of generating abundance comes love. Uh, as as some as a proverb states, out of the depths of the heart, the mouth speaks. Well, that's just one facet. Out of the depths of the heart, I act. Uh, or you will know a tree by its fruit. So the loving is associated with the abundance that has been made before and continues to be replenished. All great love is above all its pity. So this love can still feel pity, but it has something above it. For it seeketh to create what is loved, because it's too busy creating to attend to something that is failing unless it can help that thing succeed. Myself do I offer unto my love and my neighbor as myself. Such is the language of all creators. All creators, however, are hard. Thus spoke Zarathustra. All creators are hard because when a man loves a woman very... Uh, sorry. Um, <clears throat> all create, <laughs> but yes, all creators are hard because all creators are willing to be callous if need be, and to offer their neighbors to help create something as well as themselves. Love your neighbor as yourself. Give your neighbor to love as yourself. Two sides of the same coin, really. And this one chapter, as we've taken a whopping one hour to cover, guys, that's all we have for now, but we're going to be back in about 20 minutes with more. We're going to cover chapter 26, The Priests. We're going to be back, and we are going to uh, cover that one, probably do anywhere from another half hour to another hour. So thank you all for showing up. That's all we have for now. Until next time, Matt, please end the stream.